In March of 2019, United South and Eastern Tribes held their annual Impact Week meeting in Washington, D.C. During this meeting, the USAT Tribal Climate Science Liaison sat down with USAT Tribal leaders to discuss important climate change issues that are impacting Indian Country. Good day. My name is Casey Thornbrew. I am a citizen of the Mashiwampanoag Tribe, and I'm also the Tribal Climate Science Liaison with uh, United South and Eastern Tribes. Uh, I'm here today to discuss uh, climate change, uh, joined by uh, Chief Robert Gray, uh, Mr. Jerry Perdoa, and uh, Councilman David Whedon. Um, we'll be discussing climate change and uh, our tribal nations. Um, so I'll give them a chance to uh, introduce themselves. Uh, uh, Chief Robert Gray, do you want to start? My name is Robert Gray. I'm chief of the Pamunkey Indian Tribe here in Virginia, and just glad to be here. I'm Jerry Pardella. I'm a citizen of Penobscot Nation. I'm the director of the Office of Environmental Resource Management with United South and Eastern Tribes. Hello, my name is David Whedon, um, Mashpee Wampanoag, and uh, I sit on the Tribal Council and also serve as the Tribal Historic Preservation Department's uh, director and TIPO. Very good. First and foremost, I just want to say thank you for joining us today um, in discussing this very important topic. Um, one of the things, you know, when we talk about climate and we talk about change, uh, you know, living our lives in our uh, in our communities and tribal nations, I wanted to get a sense from you all in terms of, you know, growing up, you know, from childhood on, uh, what are some of the changes that you noticed, um, you know, growing up in your community, um, uh, changes happening ar around you and around your tribal nation. Um, Jerry, would you like, uh, Mr. Jerry Perdue, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. Well, I've noticed lots of changes throughout my, my life, and most of that has to do with the timing of events, whether it's the seasonal patterns or there are changes in wildlife and, in the, and plant communities. The times are variable and now they're, they're beyond the range of the times when I was growing up. So things are occurring later than when, what I recall when I was younger. Uh, as, as, as an example, I try to do an annual moose hunt. Penobscot Nation still conducts moose hunting, and we have subsistence seasons. And now that I do not live in my tribal community, I live out of state from the state of Maine, I'm trying to choose what time frame to, to conduct my moose hunt. And it's occurring later, the, the time frames are occurring later than when I was younger. Thank you. Well, for myself, I was born and raised away from our tribal community, mm -hmm. um, but I would always be visiting. And since that time, then I spent numerous years away and out of state but moving back, just even in the 30 years I've been back in the tribal community, I'm seeing various things, shoreline erosion and such that is uh, hurting our tribe mm -hmm. and just trying to figure out what we can do. Good. And Councilman Weed, you uh, spent your childhood in, in between uh, Mashpee and Rhode Island and the southern um, southeastern New England coast. What are some of the things that you remember from childhood that are, that are a little different today? The big thing I notice is um, it never gets cold enough anymore. We live right along the coastline, um, but uh, it never gets cold enough for the ice to really freeze over, and um, that's something that we enjoyed, you know, the ice skating and, uh, you know, some of the guys go eeling and things of that nature. I know my grandfather always spoke about driving out on the lake and ice fishing. Uh, they drive vehicles out on the lake. Uh, I haven't seen the the waters freeze up like that since uh in my lifetime at all um but the so the changes again come later it seems like uh they're shorter we don't get nearly the cold that we need to kind of kill off some of the uh ticks and things of that nature so uh they never die off you know so there's, there's uh evidence of it in various aspects of um how we how we uh, interact with the environment. Mm -hmm. So climate change is a, such a big topic right now, especially with the release of the fourth national climate assessment, and a lot of that looks at impacts across the country. Um, 
you know, impacts in uh, local communities, uh, certain sectors. Um, you know, there's even a, a chapter um, on uh, impacts to uh, uh, tribal nations. And so when you think of like the word like climate change, um, what would you say like some of the more maybe we, we discussed a little bit of it, but some of the more recent year impacts in the past couple of years, what would you say within your own tribal nations are some climate change impacts? And I'll leave this open for um, anyone who would like to share. Well, I'd like to mention range shifting, mm -hmm. that there are important cultural resources, food or plant sources, that their ranges are shifting. Today, our tribal boundaries, our land bases, are set either by treaty or by the, the course of our experience where our land uh, holdings have been greatly diminished. So we now have established boundaries. Mm -hmm. And the ecosystems and of the species that we've relied upon for uh, many years since time immemorial, in fact, uh, their ranges are shifting as the climate is changing and those species are migrating away from our established land bases today. And those are, those are impacts to our cultures, to availability of important plant and food sources. Uh, and I think that's, I, I observe that very much. And I, I've mentioned my example of moose hunting before, mm. and the ranges of our moose are shifting too. Mm. It's really important. And I think um, also, you know, when we talk about climate change, when you hear about it, there's, uh, terminology such as extreme events and sometimes uh, you know these things uh, definitely make the news whether it's the uh, wildfires of you know Southern California that occurred last fall or even in the winter winter type weather like the polar vortices and things like that that happen um, in recent years have um, say extreme events uh, impacted uh, your tribal nations and maybe uh, what are some examples of those extreme events well for the Pamunkey tribe we're hurricanes mm -hmm. come up we're just seeing more devastating effects from uh, hurricanes um, we've had over the years we've had a few people's homes destroyed um, and the one thing tornadoes mm -hmm. uh, never remember ever hearing about tornadoes in our area and yet that now it seems to be something we have to keep an eye out for mm -hmm. so, and how about um, how about up in Maine up in uh, up in Penobscot Nation area there this, extreme events? This, this winter there was such a, a warming that uh, the, that the, the the frozen river, the Penobscot River, experienced a breakup in January that is unheard of. Once in, in past years, once the river freezes, it's called the main the main Penobscot River freezes. It is solid and frozen until well into late spring. Mm -hmm. But this year. Uh, I heard, because I don't live in my tribal community now, that there was an, an enormous explosion heard and felt in our, in, in our tribal community the very moment that the main frozen river experienced this immediate and catastrophic breakup of the ice and it began to flow out and the river was free flowing in January and wow. people have not seen that in or ever. Mm -hmm. uh, the knowledge is that the river is fro once it's frozen, it is frozen until spring thaw mm -hmm. and break up and, and the, the, the ice flows out. Wow. It happened in January this year. Wow, it's amazing. How about in the region we know as the Cape and Islands um, in recent years? Have we had extreme weather, extreme events? For us, hurricanes as well. Uh, they come up the coast if they, you know, sustain uh, hurricane. Uh, capacity all the way to the Cape. Then the last one that I recall uh, doing a lot of damage was Hurricane Sandy. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of trees were knocked down and such. Um, that's that's the biggest one. We get impacted with blizzards and things of that nature, but they're kind of typical. Some years worse than others. Mm -hmm. um, droughts, not so much. Uh, the water has been. The water table's been down for quite a while. I think we just mm -hmm. uh, came out of a seven-year drought for the area. But um, as far as natural events, uh, I'd say hurricanes would be the prominent one. Mm -hmm. 
I find it really interesting that our, our tribal nations are all on uh, either major rivers, uh, as, you know, tributaries to near coastlines, or in, as in the case of uh, 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 Mashi, for example, right even on the coastline. Um, what are some of the changes uh, you've seen impacting uh, the waters and life within, uh, perhaps a specific species, or or even changes in in how you know how the water is, temperatures, things like that? Have you noticed changes like that um, in your waterways and coastlines? Well, we're having uh, our reservation is almost entirely surrounded by a tidal river, the Pamunkey River, mm -hmm. and what we're seeing is shoreline erosion. Now, as far as aquatic life, um, our traditional subsistence was shad. Mm -hmm. We've Shad populations have dropped off so far. The last, we run a hatchery just to replenish the river in the last two years, we haven't even been able to open the hatchery because there's not enough adult shad to catch. We also have a problem with um, invasive species mm -hmm. that we just wonder because of the warmer temperatures, hydrilla, subaquatic mm -hmm. vegetation has just been moving up the coast and that creates a problem for us. Oh, wow. How about in the Gulf of Maine? Uh, do you hear things from, from home, from family members or changes in how uh, the Gulf of Maine or the Penobscot River? Well, there are a lot of changes, and I think both, w it's a mixed record. Mm -hmm. What What is a, being experienced are some of the, the warming trends of the water mm -hmm. and fish species, even sharks being more noticeable in our waters off of the coast. There are some changes in that uh, habitat has been improved by the removal of a series of dams on the Penobscot River. Mm -hmm. So these anadromous or sea run Fish species are reestablishing their migratory passageways to uh, their spawning grounds. And so mm -hmm. a number of species, there are about 12 of them, that are returning and growing in greater numbers because habitat has been opened up mm -hmm. and the natural process is, is uh, improved so that their, their numbers can increase. So that on the net, there are some changes. Some are, are removing human uh, cause barriers such as dams, but there, it, there are also climate change effects as well that, that are causing some changes in, in the, the coastal areas and um, the, the river systems. Uh, all in all, I think it's, it's a mixed result mm -hmm. where there are some improvements made mm -hmm. and then there are some effects that are beyond our human control. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Do you, um, uh, Councilman Wheaton, do you think, uh, what are some of the things that you're noticing in the, the waterways, say Nantucket Sound or on uh, and around um, both the outer and Cape areas? Uh, the Cape, I would say that uh, the water temperature, uh, again, it doesn't get as cold. Uh, there's been some kind of uh, adverse effects to the shellfish industry and uh, closures uh, based on algae blooms and kind of high bacteria levels. I think it's attributed to the water temperatures. Uh, they close them down for a period of time. Um, that, that is directly related to the uh, water temperature uh, mm -hmm. from my understanding. Uh, another effect would be kind of the, uh, the rapid increase in sea level rise. Uh, you're starting to see some of the um, uh, priority habitats where you have the uh, wetland vegetation uh, inundated uh, so if it continues to rise at the level it's, it is uh, you know I think uh, the environments aren't going to have the opportunity to adjust uh, to compensate for that sea level rise and they you know that we, we may start seeing some of the uh, uh, priority habitats disappearing mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, coastal areas. I, I think coastal erosion caused by storm surge can affect the built infrastructure, particularly if you have facilities that are on the shoreline that have been secure for many, many years. And rising sea level and, and storm surge caused by s extreme weather events threaten those that, that built environment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and to piggyback yeah. that, uh, even the, uh, on the Cape, real estate's a prior, you know, very, um, Real estate's everything. So they built right up to the coastline in a lot of areas, and s some of the 
areas, they don't have uh, wastewater, so they uh, operate off of septic tanks. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to be concerned with uh, inundation uh, of those septic systems and uh, uh, as a sole source, source aquifer, uh, drinking water and everything, you know, wh what would be the effects of something like that uh, with a storm surge or uh, just uh, sea level rise? Right. Mm -hmm. Rising water table and exactly. effect on your drinking water sources. Mm -hmm. I'd like to piggyback on that because we're having, with our reservation, uh, state reservation, uh, in 2017, the Virginia Department of Historical Resources placed the entire reservation as on a threatened list. It's an archaeological district mm -hmm. on the basis of both climate change and severe weather events. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a shoreline erode, uh, actually longer, probably before climate change became a catchphrase. Even our own people were saying the land is sinking. Mm -hmm. And what we anticipate at some point, the first thing that's gonna go is the ability for the ground to perk for septic uh, systems to operate properly. That's all we have septic in mm -hmm. well water. So we see that as going to be our first effects. Mm -hmm. uh, not being, basically that would limit the ability to place homes uh, if the land won't perk, septic systems, the wells. Um, we, we have some in the area, some heavy withdrawals Mm -hmm. from the aquifer so we're actually thinking that yeah probably in about a hundred or so years there's a good chance our reservation is going to be underwater or just mm -hmm. not livable mm -hmm. and this is a really important segue to my next question because when we talk about um you know, climate change a lot of times uh, especially in the recent past you know there's a focus on uh it as an environmental problem um, and a lot of times we'll see the natural resources departments uh, kind of jump to address it and tackle it. But as we learn more about climate change, we learn how, how large an issue it is. And so to kind of segue, as we talked about water quality um, uh, and um, uh, impacts on like uh, cultural areas as, as well, I want to think about like health. And uh, the question I would pose to, um, to, pose to you all is that, um, in your tribal nations and communities within, do you see uh, a connection between climate change and health? And um, uh, what what might some of those uh, examples be? Well, obviously there are some physical health uh, ramifications, particularly when important foods are not available to us. And it causes a shift in diet to processed foods. Mm -hmm. and that has a lot of a f potential effect in our health outcomes. There are also the mental health aspects of this. When cultural activities are affected by shifting ranges of important resources, and, or that we cannot conduct our lifestyles, mm -hmm. our traditional activities, could be some of our plant and medicine gathering, that goes away. What does that do to us? It, but I think those are some of the cultural and mental health effects that are not easily quantified. We don't necessarily have those uh, mm -hmm. calculated in the effects that, that there are cultural effects that and that may not be well documented mm -hmm. and considered in some of the the uh, analyses for. Um, overall impacts to a region that I think there are, are cultural impacts to to our tribal communities that may not be necessarily experienced say for an inner city environment right. Right. Um, I want to start talking about you know we've talked about impacts and and changes but uh, some of the things that have been going on uh, you know, across the country and across North America and across the world to an extent is you know thoughts on climate climate change adaptation or making plans to adapt to these changes. We even have uh, many tribal nations that have started climate adaptation plans uh, to address the impacts and see what can be done um, about them. Uh, so what I wanted to ask um, you all is, you know, thinking about your tribal nations, um, what would you say some of the needs are for your tribal nations and the communities within to be able to adapt to some of these changes that we've been talking about? What kinds of resources are, uh, would be needed? Well, right now as we're sitting here, um, there's a project going on our reservation to create a living shoreline 
mm -hmm. in areas that were just rapidly losing shoreline. First, we did an um, archaeological survey because being as we, the river is our life, mm -hmm. as we're losing shoreline, first thing we're losing is archaeological um, remnants that might be there. Now they're covered with water, um, but the shoreline itself is threatening individuals' homes. Mm -hmm. So we're working in partnership with uh, College of William & Mary, Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and right now there's heavy equipment on the reservation building living shorelines mm -hmm. in certain areas, and that's just the first phase, just getting ready for that. But the way things are going, I almost see it as a somewhat band-aid approach. It doesn't change the fact maybe in another 100 years if we, our sure. reservation be underwater. Mm. Sure. And uh, uh, Mr. Jerry Perdilla, Perdilla, when you look at your own tribal nation, or maybe even tribal nations that you worked at um, across the USET uh, region, what are some of the, the needs that you've heard um, in terms of uh, from tribal nations and that would like to make a plan to adapt to climate change, would like to try to figure out a way to address it? There are a number of strategies. What really underlies the, the concerns are about our fixed boundaries today and our land bases aren't large enough for us to be able to move and respond to, say, shifting ranges of these important cultural resources. Mm -hmm. If we have small land bases and the shifts occur beyond our existing borders, perhaps an adaptation would be to work out agreements with other landowners or jurisdictions mm -hmm. about access to those shifting resources. Uh, but generally, our boundaries are fixed. When I think about the Penobscot Nation and Passamaquoddy tribes of Maine and what occurred to us as a result of our land claim settlement in 1980 is that we were not at that time and still current today not able to acquire lands that are contiguous. Mm. We did not have large blocks of lands that were in one contiguous area. Instead, we had lands that were coastal, some that were inland riverine locations. Mm -hmm. We had some that were in the, the Appalachian western mountains of Maine. And as it turns out, that ends up being a stroke of good fortune mm -hmm. because now we have lands in three zones. Mm -hmm. And as important cultural species are shifting ranges, we now have a buffer as the ranges are shifting, we can still have access to some of those important resources in the other zones. So what initially in 1980, in the early 1980s, as we were reacquiring our lands to be included in, in our respective territories, the lack now, uh, the lack then of, of, of non-contiguous lands uh -huh. has turned out to be a stroke of good fortune uh -huh. during this, these very evident changes resulting from climate change. We have three zones now, coastal, inland, and mountain lands. Oh, wow. Uh, Councilman Whedon, what would you say are some of the, you know, the needs in, in your area, and maybe even if there are some of the barriers to addressing climate change or building an ad adaptation plans, could you talk about some of those as you see them? Um, I, I would suggest a, a baseline assessment of where things are at now, um, probably an inventory of um, what we have to date, uh, more tracking uh, of the inundation of water and sea level rise um, uh, so that we can create a good plan to um, kind of deal with the situation as mm -hmm. it develops. Um, you know, it's getting worse. Uh, I do notice the water rising faster, it seems. Uh, it, it's evident. Um, we rely a lot on the uh, coastal shellfish and such as a sustenance. And uh, I'd be interested in the shellfish beds. Are they uh, s still producing at the same levels? Mm -hmm. um, because our tribe relies on that so much for uh, both for sustenance as well as, uh, you know, monetary. As a, as a fishing industry, um, uh, 
resources as far as uh, things to make baskets and mats that we've always made. Uh, how is that being affected? So I, I, I really think technical assistance with inventorying and mm -hmm. things of that nature would help. Um, and then technical assistance uh, as well as uh, creating a developed plan uh, mm -hmm. to address it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, I, I'd like to add sure. to that. I, th I think it's very important to, to do those kinds of assessments and gather that information, particularly for those important species uh, that may be driven by certain soils and, mm -hmm. and to map the soil characteristics of, of your tribal lands and say on one part the soils may be similar to another part and you might be able to, to uh, I've seen the use of, of greenhouses and, and, and propagating those species that, and, that are in one part of your tribal lands and finding similar soil char characteristics in another area and transplanting them and as, a, as a, a way to adapt to the changing environment. So you're trying to preserve those important plant species. They may be food or medicine species, but taking the inventory of your lands and mapping where those similar soils are or, or characteristics that will be ideal for preserving those species within your existing tribal land base. Mm. That, that's an excellent point, and um, I think what could help with that is uh, uh, tribes uh, getting more familiar with the GIS program and all of its capabilities. I think uh, as a resource and uh, dealing with uh, geographical information, uh, the GIS is a, a really great tool. Uh, you can kind of insert a lot of different media types uh, and a lot of different uh, types of information and data. Uh, respective to layers so that you can shut it off and isolate the information. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, developing tribal uh, proprietary GIS would be key so that they're, they're inventorying their resources and tracking them and where they are and uh, the data that goes along with that um, as far as uh, tracking, you know, that, that would be, I think, help tribes. Mm -hmm. In, in, re, in related ways, we look at climate adaptation or, pl or planning um, uh, to adapt to uh, climate change and its impacts. A lot of uh, tribal nations that have been working on adaptation plans um, have also brought in or at least discussed uh, um, traditional knowledge, and you kind of see that also um, in literature relating to climate change, um, sometimes referred to traditional ecological knowledge or TEK. Um, uh, but I just wanted to get uh, your thoughts on, on traditional knowledge and is there examples of how it can be helpful for your uh, tribal nation and communities within to, uh, to adapt to climate change? Uh, I know there's a big disconnect with uh, some of the younger ones and the older ones with all the uh, distractions that we have nowadays with cell, cell phones and computers and that. Um, so, you know, it's good to maintain those connections and, and, and interaction with the elders and the young ones uh, so that that uh, information is passed down. I think that's key in the first step. And then, um, you know, uh, maintaining the connection of uh, why lands are important, that connection to place um, is also important. Um, that's another area where I see GIS as an important tool um, to capture information and in, uh, respective to place and uh, important areas that maybe you could share stories with that. Um, the way the technology is developing, it's, uh, you could use it as a teaching tool um, mm -hmm. to uh, develop story maps uh, that uh, speak to the importance of specific places and why those places are important. Um, you know, we are a, a culture of oral history, mm -hmm. and I think uh, by using the GIS to capture those stories and document them, you know, if, if there may not be an interest now, maybe down the road somebody will come along that does have the interest and the information isn't lost, it's at least there. Um, you know, it, but it, it, should, it should always be proprietary to tribes, mm -hmm. uh, respective tribes, mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion. I see for um, our tribe, traditional fishing methods, mm -hmm. those were handed down generation to generation because they were needed. Mm -hmm. um, now it's to a point, it's, you can't make any money at it. Um, 
So for individuals, you know, their first concern is their immediate family taking care of them. So they're working. They can't afford to take off work to continue traditional fishing practices that doesn't pay off for them. And that's so now we're, it's almost like we'll be looking at just ways to encourage the cultural aspect, at, at least to continue passing down those traditions with the understanding, yeah, you're not going to make any money at it, but it's good for the culture sure. and trying to convince people to, to find the time and be willing to do that. Um, did you, well, I have some thoughts about that. It, it there are many situations, but I'd like mm -hmm. to just point out a couple mm -hmm. that have come to my mind. The commercial aspects of, of a fishery in the state of Maine practiced by Penobscot and Passamaquoddy, the, uh, juvenile eel fishing season, they're called elvers or glass eels are are an example of our experience since European contact being used to harvest a resource. Mm -hmm. And we know from past experience that there can be um, taking too much of that resource and having an impact on the sustainability of that resource. And we've seen it with the fur trapping days We've seen it with the timbering days and using our rivers for log drives and the effect on the river and the whole riverine ecosystems. And we see this continuing even today with the practice of the elver fishing season that there are commercial fishers in the state of Maine as well as tribal subsistence fishers who are contributing to the sale or the the capture and the resale of these juvenile mm -hmm. eels to uh, foreign markets. And it is, it is exploiting an important cultural resource mm -hmm. that eels um, are and still remain a food source, but we are depleting the, the juvenile stocks that may in, in the immediate future and for untold time periods ahead affecting this that population of eels available to us. Mm -hmm. So that's one example when I think about what some of those effects are, that they're still tied to the patterns we've experienced for 500 years of European contact. That had to, through traditional knowledge, that we could have conversations of looking back over generations of experience and sharing those experiences taking the lessons learned and, and applying them going forward rather than repeating those hard learned lessons uh, and experiences. So there's one aspect of that. And the other is here's a case where there are invasive species that are gaining uh, foothold in our, in our territories. Mm -hmm. uh, there are medicine plants that I'm aware of in the waters in, in, uh, in tribal territories mm -hmm. that uh, look strikingly mm -hmm. similar to the, the native plant medicine species. And when young people are gathering these, these or, or seeking to gather medicine plants <coughs> and not correctly identifying mm -hmm. the native medicine plants and the invasive plants, they are gathering a plant that may have some harmful effects when uh, used and prepared and used in the way that the native medicine plant species have been by the elders. So the traditional knowledge is important. The teachings and the lessons from the older generations to the younger generations of proper identification mm -hmm. and use of plants. And then we can use the, the science and the technology of the younger generations to identify the invasive plant species, to eradicate those, and to, to um, propagate the native plant species and reintroduce those into the environments where they will thrive and then educate the young people about where they're at and that these are the proper medicine plants. 
here's the, the differences between the two. Use this, not to use that. Eliminate that one mm -hmm. and go forward. So those are some examples of how traditional knowledge within our communities can benefit us. And then traditional knowledge more broadly can be integrated into Western science, that we have generations of stories and of oral traditions about our experience in, in this land for more than 10,000 years from the days of the, of the ice shields the, over the northern um, part of the continent and how we adapted to change as the climate warmed and many of those lessons can still be applied for how we can be adaptive to the changes that we're experiencing. Now, we, I mentioned earlier that we can always move to different locations, but we can, we can take from those old stories mm -hmm. that our old, older people know or that may have been captured and, and apply those lessons today. So, and, and also to Western science, not only to help our own communities, but to help the, the broader communities in, in, on our continent and our countries in, in the respective states where our tribes reside and in the local community. So we have a lot to offer mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's gaining more traction to, uh, to include tribal nations and traditional knowledge keepers in those conversations about how do we respond to the changing environment. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, I'd like to just uh, piggyback off uh, some of the discussion about youth a little bit because, um, you know, yesterday or last night was was quite amazing as we had so many of our tribal youth um, presenting their posters um, and presenting some of the issues of concern for them in their communities. Uh, and what I would like to ask the panel and some of your thoughts on um, how would you like to see uh, youth engaged um, in in addressing and dealing with climate change or planning for the future, ideally, how would you like to see that happen within your tribal nations? You know, for us, um, just they have the new ideas. Mm -hmm. I think uh, as alluded to, you know, the technology, uh, using those tools, working with the elders, obviously, that's that's key. Elders teaching the youth the history and such, and youth using those new technologies uh, such as GIS and anything else, uh, and they have the passion. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are seeing what's happening to the world and they're thinking for themselves, for their own children at that point. So um, I'm more than willing. I'm, I guess I'm getting up there in age a little bit. Yeah. Uh, my daughter's very concerned, other ones, and I just welcome, I just encourage them to take the reins on this because I, I trust them. They, they, they want an environment that for them and their children and their grandchildren that I applaud them for it. Thank you, thank you. Um, for me, I think it, it's key to uh, get the kids unplugged, get them out in the woods, get them outdoors. Um, it, it comes down to exposing them uh, to new things, things that they may not be familiar with um, you know, engaging them in, in, in all the various aspects of uh, traditional cultural knowledge and, 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 you know, harvesting plants and sustainability and, uh, you know, what things uh, you can acquire in different seasons. Uh, so, you know, everything encompassed together, get the kids engaged early on so that you can uh, kind of identify the ones that are taking interest. Mm -hmm. You know, as a traditional culture, we, we, we learn by um, example and, and kind of mimic uh, those uh, that are around us. And so I think if we expose them to uh, new things early on and spark the interest and then as a community nurture those interests, uh, we'll, we'll find out who, who has uh, inclination to uh, kind of run with different uh, skill sets um, in that. And, uh, you know, we always got to be supportive of the children and uh, their interests um, and nurture those. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, I think that the, the best strategy for our young people is to hold the older generations accountable 
we often speak about responsibility to seven generations. Mm -hmm. And we can look behind us and we can look forward and we can fit ourselves and at, at our generation into that seven generation continuum. But our young people are the ones that are, are coming behind us or, or and I think it, it, it is powerful when young people demand that older generations be accountable for their actions. I saw this happen in, in my tribal community when there was a strategy or consideration for using our tribal forest lands mm -hmm. as a carbon bank for uh, a market trading program in, in another part of the country. And the young people came forward at a tribal meeting, were assertive, and they were a powerful force. They brought in energy, and they brought information, and they demanded that our leaders not use our lands as a carbon sink for pollution that was being emitted in another part of the country, mm. that they thought that that was irresponsible, and they held the leaders and the older generation accountable. Mm. That was a case where I saw that they were concerned about future generations and not using our tribal lands as an offset for pollution emitted in another part of the country. Mm. I, I think they're, they're is hope when young people take that kind of initiative and organize and gather information and hold our leaders and our older generations accountable to the, the responsibilities of a seven generation uh, duty. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the power of the young people. Mm -hmm. And you. if I could add one more thing, the, uh, you know, like I said, when uh, we learn by example in a lot of ways, uh, I think it's important for the parents to, to, to not just drop the kids off when they do these programs. You know, if, if, if uh, the parents go with the children and, and learn, uh, maybe if they don't, if they're not familiar with it, then they learn and learn with the children. Uh, they create a bond and the child, if they take interest in it, the child is more likely to take interest. Um, I, I speak of that only you know, I, I, I can attribute it to, um, I grew up dancing at powwows and mm -hmm. going to powwows and events with my parents. And now I have some of those same interests and, and I did it with my children. And now we do it all together, you know, and my grandchildren are coming up. So I think they all took to it because we did it as a family and they wanted to, they emulate their parents and wanted to be like, you know, mom and dad. And, you know, so, so with that, you know, if it carries over to other aspects of our lives. Uh, you know, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, in New England, people do what their parents did, sure. you know, and um, mm -hmm. so I think we need to be mindful of that and not just drop our kids off as a babysitting service and actually learn with them, you know, and mm -hmm. um, like I said, nurture, nurture their interest, mm -hmm. whatever that may be. Sure. Thank you. And so as we conclude our segment here, there was one more thing I want to address, address and ask, and that's... Um, we're here at Impact Week, and a lot of times our, our um, programmatic staff and uh, tribal nations, we come to Impact Week, uh, we meet partners from federal agencies or other types of partners, and uh, some, of, some of them are doing work on climate change or uh, addressing it, and we also have things like the Climate Hubs and Climate Science Centers. Um, you know, they're, they're working with local communities, but also uh, working with tribal nations. And so something I wanted to ask the, the panel is, ideally, in an ideal relationship, what are some things that you would like to see, you know, if you have a, <clears throat> you know, a connection with, uh, if there's a uh, institu research institute investigating climate change or federal partners working on climate change issues, what are the ideal kinds of things you would like to see um, to help your tribal nation and communities um, do what it is you would like to do and address uh, for an adapt to climate change? With really two things I would like to see come out of this. One is that we build our own internal capabilities. Mm -hmm. And whether that is 
establishing tribal colleges among our uh, south and eastern tribal nations. Currently there are none within our, mm -hmm. our member tribal nations. I, I think that capacity development, whether we're conducting research that, that might come through our own institutions, mm -hmm. but in, in the short term we are partnering with many universities and we are, we are having our research agendas, or at least those concerns, being considered and taken up by those, by those universities. Mm -hmm. I would like for that to be carried out within our own tribal institutions and how do we establish those so, um, and so that we can take control of that agenda and we can, we can advance the kind of, of science that we need that's going to be culturally grounded and relevant and we can control the data sets mm -hmm. and preserve those important parts of our traditional knowledge that we do not want to share with the world so that we can control the intellectual property and the access to that. We need to be able to do that uh, for the, among those partners, uh, we're always concerned about their uh, use of that information, mm -hmm. authorized or not. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that there are recent examples where uh, state universities have misused information. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm thinking that we need to build those research institutions within our own region. Mm -hmm. But in the short term, we must partner with others. But we need to take control of how we, we um, work so that we can have maximum control over the data sets mm -hmm. and, and even the conclusions and the findings and the, and the papers that are written. Mm -hmm. that we are not exploited, but that those are advancing our agendas mm -hmm. and our responses to climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, Chief Robert Gray, uh, Councilman David Whedon, do you have some thoughts you wanted to add? Yeah, I would add, um, I, I agree. I, the idea of us taking charge, mm -hmm. I see it as a somewhat long process, so I'll add to it, we can act as role models, mm -hmm. mentors to non-natives mm -hmm. and share our philosophies and our thoughts. And given what's been happening, I'm seeing more and more receptive nature, at least at at a grassroots level mm -hmm. and such. Uh, I was on the board of directors for a local river association for years. Um, the local colleges are reaching out to us and for the most part, they're being very respectful. Respectful. They wanna hear our take, they wanna work with us and work uh, and really take in our desires and what we want into focus. And, and I, I really enjoy that. Um, and, and we're, we're gaining, we're gaining that scientific knowledge. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a whole lot to say about, you know, it's great the traditional going through, but I, just in my lifetime, I've seen where we've tried some things that didn't work. Sure. They were not scientifically proven, just seat of the pants. Mm -hmm. uh, but working with these and having our young people work with them so they're learning and gaining that interest to, to possibly go off to school get that interest, get get that education and that knowledge and bring it back to serve their tribe. And hopefully, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I wanna see PhDs coming out of our, mm -hmm. you know, starting our own tribal colleges and mm -hmm. continue teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and just, like I said, just working and showing the non-natives, here's the right way to do things. Sure, thank you. I would say, I, I would also agree, um, with the statements that uh, education is key. Um, I would also start with uh, kind of strategic planning. Every tribe should have a strategic plan on uh, where they want to end up um, with incremental goals to be set so that they can um, manage those uh, uh, achievements and, and the directions of their efforts uh, to kind of guide them and that should be a working uh, document, you know, um, I think that'll help uh, in the spirit of self-determination, um, nurturing programs with school systems and education. 
educational institutions uh, that that be advisable as well. Um, so any any of those combination of things. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, the traditional cultural knowledge uh, accompanied by you know scientific and and, and uh, skills is only going to help. I think you'll end up with a much better product. Yes. And um, you know also uh, regional discussions to kind of uh, talk in circles amongst tribes um, so that we can share ideas on what works, what doesn't work, um, and kind of have a more collective uh, way of uh, addressing some of the issues that we're all facing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, communication is key, and if we start mm -hmm. helping each other um, so that we're all better off, then uh, I think that would be advisable as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you all very much for joining on this panel. And before we, we close out, I just want to give one more opportunity to um, uh, uh, Chief Robert Gray, uh, Mr. Jerry Perdilla, uh, Councilman David Whedon, if it, either of you have any final comments or things you would like to share. I'm saying as I'm sitting here, I'm hearing you know, the same concerns. So this idea of regional cooperation all through this uh, uh, region, the, mm -hmm. the Northeast corridor all the way down into, I'm all for it. I, mm -hmm. I think it'd be great. We can learn from each other and um, it's a way for our young people, monkey tribe to learn and meet uh, tribal members from up north and just share ideas. And in the end, it, it will benefit everyone. Thank you. I, I think it's very important for us to mm -hmm. continue having these conversations and to have this this information sharing, the cultural exchanges, the technical knowledge exchanges. I think this is the model that we have been operating under as United South and Eastern tribes for 50 years now. Mm -hmm. And we see that the, there are many benefits to this. Uh, I support that. And you can hear the themes that come out of our conversations that these are reflective of, of our region. And I think we, we can benefit greatly by continuing these conversations and bringing in generations and science and traditional knowledge to adapt to the changes that we've experienced over many generations in our own homelands throughout our whole region that we've been here since time immemorial. Mm. And we see a long future ahead of us. And it's this kind of regional cooperation that will help us be best poised to, uh, to assess the changes and to respond to those going forward. Thank you. Yeah, uh, you said it's a great organization bringing tribes together. I look forward to the conferences all the time. You know, opportunities like this to sit down and talk and uh, share ideas. Um, it's always something that I look forward to and uh, commend you set on doing a great job. Uh, thank you for all your work. Casey, uh, for uh, you know, sharing information and, and, and opportunities uh, to tribes. Uh, that's always welcome. That helps in a big way, and um, you do a good job with that. So you know, thank you for all your work, all of USET's uh, work as well. And um, I think that's all I would add. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Chief Robert Gray, uh, Mr. Jerry Perdilla, uh, in addition of former uh, governor of uh, uh, Penobscot Nation, uh, Mr. Jerry Perdilla, and Councilman uh, David Whedon. Thank you all for your time today, and thank you for being here. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. For more information about how you can support USET and USET SPF, please go to usetinc.org and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Individuals that donate to USET and USET SPF ensure that we are able to continue sharing stories that inform and inspire audiences. Donations of any size help advance this essential advocacy work for Indian Country.